烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，烧埃铃铃声。Namaste. So we've been through a very intense time these last three months. All the outer planets have been retrograde. In fact, at one point, all the planets were retrograde, except the the Sun, Moon, Rahu, and Ketu, which. Rahu and Ketu are always retrograde, and the sun and moon are always forward moving. But at one point, Venus, Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the outer planets—Neptune,、uh, Uranus, and Pluto—were all retrograde at the same time. Good grief! <laughs> of course, this brought up everybody's big issues in life. And you had to do something about them. You had to solve them somehow. Well, I don't know about you, <laughs> but I've managed to solve my big issues. You know, for the last about eight years now, I've been taking a really close look at liberation. Liberation, mukti, moksha, freedom from birth and death, freedom from samsara, not having to come back into this world and take birth again. And I spent, I don't know, five or six years going deep into the Buddha's teaching, and even became a Buddhist monk. You can see in some of the early videos on this channel. And I got it, <laughs> you know. I really got it. I even realized it. And then I came to India, and I was investigating Ramana Maharshi's teaching. And the thing that these two teachings have in common is that they both strive for the same kind of liberation. There are five kinds of liberation. And the kind that the Buddha and the Advaitins pursue is called、um, what is it called? Sayuja. Sayuja means you cease to be an individual, and you merge into the Brahman, or you attain Nirvana or Nibbana in Pali. And basically, you cease to exist. There's no more I, no more separateness, like that. Now, the interesting thing about this kind of liberation—it、uh, seems to be very popular these days. And the other thing about it is, it's very easy, comparatively, very easy to attain this liberation. And of course, it still takes a lot of work. We see here in India a lot of people coming from the West, and they want something very quick, you know, something cheap. They don't have to spend a lot of time on, and so they mo mostly pursue this kind of liberation, where you just disappear. And The thing about that is, this liberation is given to the demons. Who are demons? Demons are the people who go against dharma, who don't support the conclusions of the scriptures, who don't worship the deities in the temples, who don't perform regular sadhana, but they make up their own path. Or they、uh, follow the tantras, 
or the Agamas. And the Agamas and Tantras, although they're related to the Vedas, are actually non-Vedic because they don't follow the Vedic principles. So I mentioned there are five kinds of liberation, right? Well, what are the other kinds of liberation? Well, first of all, there's Salokya. In Salokya liberation, you attain non-dual consciousness, but you still retain your individuality. And you go to the spiritual planets, the Lokas, that's why it's called Salokya. It means the same planet. You go to the same planet as the deity that you worship. And of course, to get really moksha, you have to worship a transcendental deity, not a demigod like Indra or Varuna or Ganesh or even Vishnu, but Narayan, Sadashiva, or the mother goddess. They are transcendental to this material world. They are never born and they never die. So to worship these is to be admitted to their planets and it's not easy. First of all, whatever kind of liberation you get is not something done by you. It's something that is awarded by higher authorities. And to develop the qualification for Salokya is much higher than Sayujya. So most of the people go for Sayujya because it's easy. But I, I attained it. I realized it, but it wasn't satisfying. So after spending these last seven or eight years looking into this, I was feeling very frustrated. I wasn't meeting the kind of people that I like. I mean, here I am in practically the capital of Sayuja, <laughs> Tiruvannamalai. And I wasn't happy. I couldn't find anybody I felt interested in. So what happened? I got a blessing. I got a Shakta Guru. And last year I took sannyas from him. Then after he left his body, I kind of went back into the, the uh, Brahman realization and Sayuja Mukti mood. But then something happened. I got a blessing. I started looking into the Shakta scriptures, the Sri Vidya, and practicing the Sri Vidya methods, and some of the mantras I've given on here, and some of the scripture readings I've done on here are to point you in that direction, give you a look at that viewpoint. And I found it much more satisfying. So you can have Salokya, you can have Samipya. Uh, Samipya is when you become a personal associate of the deity that you worship in the spiritual world. Sarupya is when you have a four-armed form, male or female, just like the deity that you worship. And uh, Salokya, Sarshti, Sarshti liberation, you have the same opulences as the deity that you worship. Beauty, strength or power, wealth, knowledge, renunciation, and like that. So in, in these ways, you can get different kinds of liberation depending on your desires. And your desire is related to your rasa, the mood, the emotional connection with your presiding deity, Ishtadevata. So, to make a long story short, I have dropped this idea of Sayuja Mukti. It's not my taste, really. My taste is Salokya, Samipya, Sarupya, huh? Sarshti. I would take any one of those and where do I want to go? 
I want to go to the planet of the goddess. Because since I've been chanting this uh, 16 syllable mantra, Sodashi mantra, Maha Sodashi, it's mentioned in the scriptures to be the most powerful mantra. And this is also my experience. So I'm going to give up my place in Tiruvannamalai, even though it's a lovely place, but it's in the wrong place. <laughs> I mean, being here has been good for me. It's enabled me to clarify and understand many subtle things. So what I'm going to do is go on pilgrimage to the 50 or 51 Shakti Pitas. The Shakti Pitas are the places in India and, and just near India, like Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, where when, uh, how can you explain this without telling the whole story? When, when Sati, Shiva's wife, basically committed suicide when her father Daksha insulted Shiva. Shiva went crazy and he holding her body, he started doing his Tandava, his dance of destruction. And to keep him from destroying the entire universe, Vishnu had to cut the body, the dead body of Sati into pieces and scatter them so that Shiva couldn't find them. So he cut the body into 51 pieces and the 51 pieces represent the 51 characters of the Sanskrit alphabet. A, A, E, E, U, U. These are called the Matrika. And I read some time ago, I did a video on the Matrika Stuti. Matrika Stotra. And this is the prayer to Gaya tree, the form of the goddess, as the letters of the alphabet. So she is the meaning of name and form, huh? like we talked about in all our teachings on the Buddha's, the Buddha's teaching. The Paticca Samuppada talks about name and form. Name and form is the basis of consciousness, and consciousness produces name and form. So they have a reciprocal relationship. It becomes a vortex. And this is the vortex theory that we've talked about, and so on and so on. It's all connected. So these 51 places, each one of them represents or is uh, a sacred place that when this particular part of the Devi's body cut up by Vishnu fell to earth and each one became a, a holy place of pilgrimage where that particular part of the goddess is worshipped. And by, by going to these places and performing certain rituals and so on, you get the, rich, the realizations that these different uh, matrikas give. And you, so you meditate on the matrika, like ang, 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 ing, ing, uh, and so on. Ung, ung, ring, ring, and so on. So you meditate on these and you do certain prayers and pujas and stuff like this and worship the deity of the goddess in that place. And what happens is you realize all knowledge. Like lately I've been working on the Devi Bhagavatam. I started to do a few readings from just the beginning, but now I've gotten into the second part. I'm up to the uh, seventh skanda and I've skimmed through the rest of it and it's just wonderful. It's just amazing. Gives the backstory on everything. Why you do the pujas, the mantras, the rituals, the different deities and everything. How, why it is the way it is. Why it all works. How it all fits together. It's the key that that brings together all these different pieces, huh? these 51 pieces. You know, I had the theory for the longest time that the knowledge has been scattered. 
And now I know how it got scattered and why it was scattered and how to put it back together. So over the next few months, I'm going to be going on pilgrimage to actually over the next two years, I have it all planned out. I'm going to be going on pilgrimage to all these holy places and doing those rituals to unify the knowledge and gain the final liberation. Aum Tatsat. Aum Shakti Aum.